The thing I love about God is that he just doesn't send Jesus to die for us and then leave us dangling out there on our own. God actually sends his Holy Spirit to dwell in us and he gives us so much wisdom through his word to help us live our lives for his glory. I love that about God. Hi, I'm Bernie Diamond. Welcome to Christianity Works. As we head into our final message in a series that's called Wisdom to Transform Your Life. Because God has so much wisdom available in his words, so much he wants to share with you and with me. Uh, I can be a bit of a dunce sometimes in, in relationships. Um, I'm, I'm sure you make mistakes too. You blunder in somewhere and you think afterwards, that. How could I have been so stupid? Why didn't I see that? Why, why didn't I handle that differently? Why didn't I handle that better? You've had that experience, right? So, so have I. And I want to talk specifically about wisdom in relationships now. Because let's face it, 99% of the trouble that happens in our lives happens through relationship problems. Whether that be our relationship with God, or whether it be our relationship with our wives or husbands, our children, our friends, our work colleagues, our neighbours, all these disputes, all these arguments, all this conflict, it ends up ruining your life. And I believe God wants to share some of his powerful wisdom into our lives, into our relationships at the moment. So let me ask you to just take a quick stock take of your relationships, in particular, the ones that aren't going so particularly well at the moment. Maybe you have a problem with one of your siblings or maybe your marriage isn't going so well or maybe there's strife at work and you're, you're just always at loggerheads with, with one of your colleagues or one of your bosses at work. Just think about the relationships that you have at the moment that aren't headed in the direction that you want them to head, that aren't full of peace and love and kindness and gentleness. Okay, you got the pictures of those people in front of you? Now let me ask you, how much of that is your fault? Well, it's not my fault. If only that person over there, right? That's how we respond. It's never our fault. It's always their fault. Be honest. How much of it is your fault? Maybe the initial part of the conflict wasn't your fault. But what have you done to bring healing, to bring reconciliation, to bring forgiveness into that situation. Open your Bible, please, if you have one. Let's open it. Let's go to God's Word. Let's go to Psalm 34, verse 14. It's pretty short and to the point. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Just apply that to your difficult relationships at the moment. You know, the first half of that verse Depart from evil and do good. If you've been doing anything wrong, maybe you haven't been listening to the person. Maybe you haven't been kind to the person. Maybe you've been ignoring the person. Maybe you've had angry words for that person. Maybe you've been talking about them behind their back. Come on. In your difficult situations, what's the evil that you've been doing? Here's God's word for you today. Depart from that evil. Stop it. Stop doing the wrong things that you're doing in that relationship. But it doesn't end there. This is a double-sided transaction. It's like, it's like accounting with, with a double-sided ledger, double-sided bookkeeping. There are two sides to this transaction. The first is depart from evil. The second is do good. Depart from evil and do good. It doesn't sound like an optional extra to me. It doesn't sound like advice. This is God speaking to you and me into our relationship. So, maybe you opened your mouth and someone jumped down your throat. And you thought, hang, hang on a minute. 
I didn't do anything wrong. What, what did I say? Why did I jump down my mouth? And so what you want to do is you want to jump down their throat. You want to beat them up. You want to give them their just desserts, right? And often that's what we do. Or the opposite is that passive-aggressive behavior. I'll show him. I just won't talk to him. I just, I just won't have anything to do with him. I won't do anything. That's what we often do. Depart from that evil. Now, now that you've stopped doing the wrong thing, now that you've stopped attacking them or doing the passive aggressive, listen to this and do good. Those difficult relationships, those people, what opportunity do you have to do them good? to bless your enemy, to love your enemy. If someone asks you to go one mile, offer to go the extra mile. If someone slaps you on this cheek, offer them the other cheek. Often people do bad things because they're just conditioned to, because they're under pressure, because they're hurting, because they're struggling. I heard it said once that if we could just know the terrible things happening in the lives of our enemies, that would disarm us of hostility. Maybe that difficult person at work is struggling in their marriage at home. Maybe, maybe they've got a kid at home who's on drugs and so they're under stress and pressure all the time. Maybe they're struggling with their mortgage. We often don't take the opportunity to find out why they're behaving the way they're behaving. When someone does something bad to you, don't repay evil with evil. Repay the evil with a blessing. In your most difficult relationships, let me ask you something. How can you bless that person? What are the practical things you can do to bless that person? Let's look at the second line in that verse of the psalm. Seek peace and pursue it. Try and bring peace into the situation. Be proactive. Seek peace. Don't just sit there. Seek it out and pursue it. Chase it down as a priority. Come on. What can you do to bring peace into that difficult relationship. Do you notice something? We've just spoken about one verse in one psalm. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven words. How much wisdom is packed into those eleven words? And that's often what you find in the Bible. God's word is, is so packed with wisdom. Sometimes people say, oh, I read three or four chapters of the Bible a day. Hey, if I was in a difficult relationship and I was reading the next chapter that I was due to read and I came across that verse, I would stop at that verse. Seriously, I'd just stop at that verse and say, God, God, what, what are you saying to me? Speak to me. Speak your wisdom into my heart. In his famous Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. How we handle conflict as followers of Jesus Christ is one of the most powerful statements of what we believe and who Jesus is. In fact, when you think about it, conflict is the most amazing mission field because we have the opportunity to bring into that battlefield the love, the gentleness, the mercy, the kindness, the goodness of Jesus Christ. And when we do that, when we bless those who curse us, when we show mercy to those who deserve our punishment, we stand out from the crowd. It's so unusual. People look at that and they go, hang on, what's different about that person? What's different about you? And all of a sudden, Jesus walks across that bridge. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Wouldn't it be great for the people around you to look at you and go, wow. I, I could never have handled that with wisdom. I could never have handled that with such compassion. What's that person got? I want some. That's the missional power of being a peacemaker. So instead of judging other people, instead of getting angry with them, and look, we get angry, it's, a, it's an immediate response, but instead of staying angry with people, you and I have an opportunity to show the love and the compassion that Jesus showed to us. How many times have you failed Jesus? Come on, how many times have you sinned against God? How many times have you stuffed up? How many times have you gone, Duh, how could I have done that? And you've gone to God and you asked for his forgiveness. And what does God do? God forgives you like that. In 
in an instant. And the reason he does and the reason he can is because Jesus suffered and died for you. You know, being a peacemaker hurts a lot of the time. Being a peacemaker involves suffering. It involves humility. Being a peacemaker can be really, really hard. I'm not talking about being a victim here. Jesus was a peacemaker in that he suffered and died for us. There was no way that Jesus was a victim. He said, I don't let them take my life. I lay down my life willingly and I'll take it up again willingly. Jesus was no man's victim. He just suffered and died to bring peace into the relationship between God and you, God and me. Friend, you have opportunities to show the love of God right now in the conflict situations that you're involved in. You have opportunities to proactively step out and be a peacemaker. Stop the evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. I want to pray for your difficult relationships right now because this is hard. Some of those people have hurt you. Some of those people are really difficult to forgive. Father, I pray for the broken relationships as we gather around your word today. I pray for those who are hurting, who are struggling to forgive, who are struggling to do good, who are struggling to be peacemakers. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would take this word of yours, Psalm 34, verse 14, and etch it on our hearts. Not just that, but show us the practical things that we can do to stop evil, to do good, to seek peace, to pursue it, to forgive, to show mercy, to show kindness, to show love, to put our arms around someone who's hurting even though they've slapped us in the face. Lord, give us practical ideas where we can live out your wisdom, godly wisdom in our most difficult relationships. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I don't know about you, but I, I find that really exciting. We can continue to fight with people and argue with people, be horrible to people, not talk to people. We, we can keep doing that. But the call of God on our lives is to stop doing evil and instead to do good. As you do good, I guarantee you this. The other person may not initially react well. We don't know. But God will see it. And God will bless it. And God will bless you. There may be healing and reconciliation. There may not. But as you step out to be a peacemaker for the glory of God, God will be in that place with you. And God will honor you for honoring him. I just want to take a moment to remind you of the, the thousands of teaching resources available here at ChristianityWorks.com. One of the things I really encourage you to do, if you haven't done so already, you can have instant access to the free daily video devotional, words of inspiration, words of hope and encouragement, delivered right to your inbox on your smartphone, tablet or computer each and every day. It's completely free. I believe that as you receive the word of God into your heart, God is going to bless you with wisdom that you just can't believe. That's the daily e-devotional. It's called Fresh, and you can get instant access right now on the Christianity Works homepage. May God bless you as you receive his word into your heart. Pretty much each and every day of my life begins the same way. Normally I wake up when it's still dark. Normally, not always. I get up. I have a shave, clear my teeth, have a shower, I might do some exercise, I go to work, weekends, I take some rest. But there's this kind of, this, this humdrum routine, day after day after day. Every now and then we take a break, we go on a holiday, every now and then we might travel for work, a bit of a change of scenery, but pretty much day after day is the same. My observation of life is that 99.5% of life is the humdrum. There are some really exciting bits, some really fun bits, and sometimes there are some really sad bits and difficult bits too. 
but most of it, well, we just chug along same day after day after day. And you get to the point of thinking, well, okay, I, I believe in Jesus. I've been blessed by his love. I, I read the Bible every day. I, but it's just getting boring. It's just the same. I feel like, I feel like I'm in a rut. I feel like, and, and then I make mistakes. Then, then I snap at my wife or, or I snap at one of the kids or I, I, I waste money here. I, I do stupid things. I wonder what God thinks of me. I wonder what God thinks of my life and, and how I'm living my life. And They're the things that go through people's minds. This is why people drift away from God. This is why the passion goes out of a relationship with God because, because the reality of the humdrum takes over. Can I tell you, in my life, the one thing that stops that from happening, the one thing, is spending some time every morning in the Word of God. It's like a marriage. It's like coming home and listening to my wife speaking to me and seeing what's going on in her life. When I spend time in the Word of God, in the Bible, God speaks to me. God speaks His love to me, His encouragement to me, His wisdom to me, His truth to me. When I'm starting to doubt things, God just reminds me of what Jesus did for me. God just reminds me of how much He loves me. And right now, I want to share a piece of wisdom from God's Word with you. A piece of wisdom for you today to encourage you to hang on to, to bring some joy back into that humdrum relationship that you may be having with God at the moment. Are you ready? Open your book, open your Bible at Lamentations chapter 3, beginning at verse 22. Now, while you're doing that, let me tell you, Lamentations is, a, is an interesting book. It's written by a man in around 587 BC. Just when the Babylonians had come, as Isaiah and other prophets had predicted, to destroy Jerusalem and the temple. They take God's people, the Jews, into captivity to Babylon to be slaves, as it turns out, for the next 70 years. All that's happened. And this man is standing in Jerusalem, surveying the wreckage. Everything's been knocked over. The city's been burnt down. The temple, the temple where God lived, has been destroyed. The sense of devastation in this man's heart is palpable. If you read the book of Lamentations, it's only a very short book. You're left feeling bereft for this man. The sense of loss that he's suffering, everything they believe, their home, their very being has been destroyed. God's people have been taken into captivity and God's temple has been knocked over. In the middle of that, this is what the man speaks. Lamentations chapter 3, beginning at verse 22. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Have you ever been in a place in your life of, of complete devastation? Maybe something's gone wrong. Maybe nothing's gone wrong. Maybe you're just feeling empty and hollow and bored inside. And then you open the Bible and you read this. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Let me make that a bit more personal. The steadfast love of the Lord for you never ceases. His mercies for you never, never come to an end. They are new every morning. So tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning when you get up, I just encourage you to take a little bit of quiet time and open the Bible into this piece of wisdom literature. And that's what it is in the Bible. The genre of literature of the book of Lamentations is wisdom literature. And garner this piece of wisdom, Lamentations chapter 3, Verses 22 and 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. I, I've read that sometimes in those times when, when nothing seems to be going right and nothing seems to be happening. and I feel as though I've been left on a shelf and it's all just humdrum, boring, boring, boring. And the Holy Spirit shines a light in my heart. He lights a fire in my heart. 
I realize how much God loves me. I realize that it doesn't matter what my circumstances are. It doesn't matter how bad things are, whether Jerusalem's been destroyed, whether the temple's been knocked over. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every, every, every morning. We live in a world of cause and effect. I was talking just the other day to a man who is very much overweight and he's, he's getting older and he's getting sicker. And I talked to him about just some basic exercise. And he said, I don't have time to exercise. So I said to him, well, friend, do you have time to get sick? Do you have time to be in hospital? Do you have time to have a stroke? Because that's where you're headed. We live in a world of cause and effect. So many people tell me they don't have time to read the Bible. They don't have time to listen to God speak. They don't have time to spend that intimate, quiet time with Jesus. Well, friend, do you have time for your life to be in a mess? Do you have time for things to go badly for you? God hasn't stopped speaking. God is still speaking every day. In that Bible, you open it and God will speak to you. God loves you. He, he wants to communicate with you. He wants to share his wisdom with you. And he's a God who's not just up there in heaven. He's not distant. He's not remote. This God is on your life's journey with you. This God is with you every step of the way. You know, back there in the Old Testament, all the, the idols and the gods that all the other nations worshipped lived up in, in temples on hilltops. They were, they were inanimate. They were just bits of wood and bits of silver and bits of tin. They couldn't travel to the people, so the people had to travel to them. All the other nations worshipped false gods who lived in temples on hilltops. Have a listen, though, to the God of Abraham. Isaac of Jacob, the God who led his people into the promised land. Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 and 22. The Lord went in front of them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them along the way and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light so that they might travel by day and by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Well, that's not quite true. Because just after that was written, the Egyptian army came chasing them and the, the pillar of, of, of fire lifted itself up and went behind the million or so Israelites and placed itself between God's people and the Egyptian army to protect them. But for the next 40 years, the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, never left the people. That was God's presence. God was on that journey with them. And this was such a radical concept because all those other gods, inanimate as they were, had to live in temples. They couldn't go on a journey with anyone. They couldn't leave their temples because they were just bits of wood and tin and, and silver and gold. But God, for 40 years, journeys with his people. And that same God is on your journey with you right now. If you believe in Jesus, you've received the Holy Spirit. And this is what Jesus has to say about that very thing. John chapter 14. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I'll ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. In other words, the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God himself is with you and in you on your journey to give you all the power you need, all the wisdom you need, all the love and the compassion you need. Your God is in you, journeying with you just as powerfully, just as amazingly as he journeyed with the Israelites for those 40 years in the wilderness. You and I, simply don't have the wisdom that we need to get through all the things we have to get through. I always laugh at people who say, God never gives you anything that you can't handle. Well, we must be living on different planets because God consistently gives me things I can't handle. He wants me to trust in him. He wants me to depend on him. He wants me to go to his word 
through his spirit and get his wisdom, his godly wisdom, his often counterintuitive, counterworldly wisdom to do things his way for his glory. Jesus said to his disciples, it is for God's glory that you should bear much fruit, the fruit of the spirit, the fruit of God's wisdom, the fruit of God's love. The same fruit that Jesus bore for you on that cross. I really want to encourage you, as I often do, to be a man or a woman of God's word. To be someone who grows in the wisdom of God, in the love of God. Father, I pray for each one of us. Lord, we so often do stupid things. We so often fall short. We so often don't know which way to turn and how to handle a difficult situation. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you give us wisdom that works. Wisdom that transforms our lives. Wisdom that helps us to live our lives for your glory. Lord Jesus, fill us with your Holy Spirit and your wisdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Friend, I'm excited for you. I'm excited to see what will happen in your life as you open up God's word and start living out his wisdom for his glory. May you be truly blessed as you receive the word of God today. Well, that's all we have time for. That was the last message in a series called Wisdom That Works. Don't forget, the other three messages are also available on this page on the website. I really encourage you to get into God's Word and to discover the wisdom that He has for you. And check out the rest of the site. There are so many free resources and downloads available to help you get the wisdom of God into your heart. I'm Bernie Diamond. You've been watching Christianity Works. I'll catch you again another time with another message of God's love, God's grace, and God's power for each one of us in Jesus Christ.